There we go. A few minutes late, but we're up and running. Welcome to Watch Buck Studios at the 1916 Company. I am Tim Masso. This is Watches Tonight. This evening, we talk about Breitling's comeback and models chat live, and I share your wrist chats this evening, tonight, on Watches Tonight. We've got both Sean and Garrett on the switcher. They're fighting with a computer that's probably due for retirement. New hardware coming, I promise. We got McLauder, Pizza Man, Edward Ledden of Sweden, the Mick in Florida, Ordinary 999, stand up late in Norway, Eric R. from Utah, Don R. from Alberta, Canada, in the Great White North, Wolfgang, a man by one name, we know who he is. He's like Cher, he's like Madonna, and he hails from Austria. 614K9, welcome, my man. Lloyd Kerr from Maryland and burping hard. You are all watching the Houdinki successor. Um, yes, rumors are flying, aren't they? I don't know if this will be the Houdinki successor. I hope to be around for a while, and like I said, with them, rumors are flying. Christopher H., greetings from the deep heart of Texas. Mr. Han, welcome. Michael Aziz, Karate Chop, and Geezer, welcome into the box. Will Charlesworth, thank you for staying up late in London. Yeah, because so much that's being said about Hodinkee right here is second and third hand information, we're not going to talk about this tonight, but there will be reactions if we have any substantive hot takes later on. Okay, for now, if you follow this program, follow me on Instagram. I just updated it three times. It's the official after party of Watches Tonight. Important to note, I have over 2,500 one-minute reviews. So if you like the long ones, check these out. You can literally daisy chain my Instagram channel and binge watch it. Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Andrew T. Tim, what's your opinion on Bever watches? Are you going to do an interview with him or do a watch review? I did do an interview with him and I did show the watch. So check out our coverage of Dubai Watch Week 2023. I like the watches. They're very expensive. At that price, I'd be looking at used JLC pieces that do the same thing for like a third of the money. But again, the opportunity to know JC Bever and his family personally might be worth the premium for some folks. And they definitely sized them right. A normal person can wear them. Okay. Okay, viewer wrist shots number one, Tim Q leads off with his incredible platinum Romaco TAC on a colorful OEM strap. Jim M pegs the meter with his stunning Laurent Ferrier classic lapis lazuli 10 piece limited edition. Mike P from Omaha impresses with his vintage Roger Dubuis homage 37 perpetual calendar. Marceau R and Benoit the dog appreciate his Swiss national colored HYT H0. That's my, probably my favorite watch of the night there. Seymour M goes big with his IWC Big Pilots Watch Mojave and Land Rover Defender colored to match. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. I think after we're completely 1916, I'm still going to use that catchphrase because I like it. Celine Driver joining in. Brady P, we've got Drome, we've got Scott, we've got Ivar joining in from Miami, and Thomas Price. Welcome, guys, and thank you so much. I'm glad to see you here. Okay, Breitling in 2024. For all practical purposes, guys, even though the takeover, the arrival of Georges Kern, it was 2017, 2018 was year one for Breitling as we know it today. 2017 was the new ownership. Equity stepped in, an American company called CVC Capital Partners, a new management team led by former IWC head honcho and tag Hoyer entrepreneur Georges Kern arrived. And we had all sorts of new watches in 2018, starting with the Navitimer 8s, actual Navitimers, premieres, and new design codes, such as tone-on-tone -tone dials denoting an in-house caliber on chronographs. While the Navitimer 8 line was considered a swing and a miss, I thought they were anodyne, they were not Navitimers. Uh, frankly, no one was excited about them. I went to the launch and everyone was putting on a brave face, but it was the wrong watch at the wrong time. And it gave us doubts about the durability and direction of the Breitling comeback. But there's some reasons why I'm going to write this off, and we might talk about that a little bit later. This was not a project born of the new management. I think this was a holdover. I think they had to do what they could with it, and it was originally called something other than Navitimer. Again, more on that in a moment. But subsequently, and this is where things really started to look up, vintage re-editions like the reference 806 1959 arrived for brand traditionalists alienated by the size and the bombast 
of the 2000s and 2010s Breitling models, and they really did get out of hand on that front. So CEO George Kern declared a break from prior practice. The retro reissue watches would be true to size and to omit a date if the historical prototype had none. And as an example, here's the 2020 AVI Reference 765 1953 re-edition and the original watch. At first glance, it's darn hard to tell them apart. This is reissue done right. The few departures from historical precedents were fun, thoughtful, and worthwhile, as with this 2020 Super Ocean Limited Edition. It was part of the Super Ocean Heritage 57 capsule collection, and that one was an LE sold to benefit uh, medical charities at the height of the initial COVID outbreak. So while it was not historically true, it was fun, it was colorful, the money went to a good cause, I don't think anyone was complaining. It was right-sized and right-styled, and it definitely lifted the image of the brand. Super Avengers, under Kern, a little bit much, right guys? Were replaced by fresh takes, like the 40mm manual wind Premier B09 Pistachio of, 19, of 2021. And this is a watch that was just, in every way, a breath of fresh air, really. Manual wind, B09 movement. Uh, it started to get more play. We started to see more manual wind calibers, taking the B01 and essentially not decapitating it, but I guess sawing off its legs, taking off the automatic winding system to create thinner watches that would, frankly, increase appeal to traditionalists who'd been alienated from the brand. Under George Kern, the controversial 20-year partnership with Bentley Motors came to a satisfying conclusion, to be perfectly honest. Look, I liked the Brooklyns, but that sort of over-the-top bombast works better on a car than it does a watch. And thanks to watches like the Premier B01 Chronograph 42 British Racing Green of 2018, we started getting watches that really did feel like they were as refined and sophisticated as a Bentley can be, not just as big and as loud. We got the Burlwood Dial Bentley Centenary of 2019, which was absolutely gorgeous in all its forms. The strap was even better with a contrasting cross stitch. And then we had 2021 stunning Chrono Torbion for Bentley. The car collab ended with a string of crowd pleasers that frankly compare well relative to the controversial design direction of earlier pieces. That almost looks like a counterfeit watch. Somehow there's an AP movement in there and yet it looks fake. That's what I mean about the controversial early direction of Breitling for Bentley. Common to all of these Bentleys was appeal that transcended the early model's reliance on sales to a captive audience of Bentley drivers and wannabe Bentley drivers. All of these premieres, the wood dials, the tourbillon, these were watches that, frankly, anyone could enjoy. The last licks of the Breitling Bentley series were remarkably broad in their appeal. Now, certain historically linked models were turned not as retro machines, but as modernized interpretations of their former selves, such as the 1984 Chronomat, which under the Schneiders was really the comeback watch for the brand. People forget it wasn't the Navitimer early on that lifted the company out of the bankruptcy. That was considered to be the watch that, at least until the Super Ocean Heritages in 2007, was the best-selling modern Breitling collection. And it returned as 2020's Chronomat collection of 42 millimeter chronographs on 1980s style rouleau bracelets. And again, the Bentley Green model was so handsome that one needed no financial or emotional link to the cars in order to desire and enjoy this watch. It was a real triumph, and it worked on both levels. Great Bentley tribute, great Breitling watch. It wasn't one or the other. Also, there were occasional olive branches to the Schneider era Breitling and Breitling for Bentley fans, such as the 2021 Super Chronomats of 44 millimeters. And even though it was big, it was well done. Because even then, 44 is not 48 like they were doing prior, and the details were a lot more refined. If we can go full screen there, you can see that this is a really thought out design. The accents of steel, 
color of blue and red, use of ceramic inserts, chrono pusher and crown shoulder. That was really well done. That was big done beautiful. And frankly, I appreciate it even though I don't have the wrist for it. Also, you can see if we go back to the Super Chronomats image from a moment ago, the revival of the UTC module proved that even here on the big watches for the old guard, the folks from the 2000s and the 2010s, Breitling was still serious about preserving and curating its history, and the UTC module and the bracelet was a big part of that. But for every 44 millimeter Super Chronomat, there have been Breitling watches that embody the revived brand's less is more approach to design. Like the 40 millimeter Chronomat GMT40, they bring my little Breitling B in here. Notice how it's bereft of wings. Breitling today wants you to think of it as a land, sea, and air sports company, not just air. But look at this watch right here. Again, this is a watch, 40 millimeters, uh, for frankly, everyone who can wear a watch. Maybe the ladies have to sit this one out, but even my spindly wrist can appreciate this watch. This is a 2022 piece that was Georges Kern era Breitling at its absolute best. A wearable case size combines with a useful complication and a stylistic nod to the post-1983 Chronomat series. There's a green dial for me, because you know how much I love my green dials. They might be just about done in the mainstream. I think their 15th minute of fame is, is nigh, but for me, the green dial will always be the choice. But for everyone else and for all time, I would say there is the more generally appealing blue dial, which cleverly, was also offered. And a cool 80s style rouleau bracelet that's vastly stronger than the tinsel-like version from the Reagan era. This rouleau is both gorgeous and robust. It's now a true sports watch bracelet. Specs are solid with a manufacturer caliber, 70 hours of power reserve, five year warranty, 200 meter water resistance, a diving bezel that makes this more than a GMT. It's also a valuable and viable dive watch that works perfectly fine on that basis plus you get a COSC chronometer certification. This is an outstanding value. It's priced close to Tudor, rather than Rolex levels. And I believe the Breitling is 5,350. So you can see Breitling going head to head with Tudor. That makes a lot of sense. I think at that level, the Breitling is competitive and it undercuts the Rolex as Rolex is accelerated away onto a different plane of price and standing and stature. The Breitling is still quite honestly priced to compete with the likes of, I would say, Longines, Tudor, and Oris. And it does that really well. Let's see what's going on in here. Celine Driver saying, Concerning the Rouleau, I love that bracelet. We've got Karsten saying Pistachio or the fairly recent Navi 59 or Cosmo reissues are the three Breitlings I would like to own. Richard Jean saying the Breitling B01 Norton edition with the brown straps is my favorite watch. And Decibel saying really love the Premier Duo time. It's a module but impressive nonetheless. Gorgeous but a bit bigger than I can accommodate. And Mark S. saying, buy what you like, watches are not an investment. I agree with that. We have watch enthusiast, I finally got to catch the show live. Hi from Italy. Watch enthusiast, thank you for staying up late with me in the Maso family's ancestral homeland. I think for the most part we are Southern Italian though. I know my grandma and her side of the family, the Cavaluzzi's, they were all blonde haired and blue eyed. But my dad, I think Sicilian. Okay, so what's going on here? And, and his dad, Sicilian. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what else is going on. Because Breitling is addressing its blind spots in terms of market points with the Universal Genève edition from December of last year. Historically known for chronographs, calendar watches, and the Pole Ruder series, Universal Genève has been more abundant as a manufacturer for most of the last decades. It was, for all intents and purposes, a great name, but a dead brand. Much like how Theodore Schneider and his family found the, and his father before him, found the Breitling Company after the bankruptcy in the late 70s. So, what will happen to Universal Genève? Breitling CEO Georges Kern, who helped steer Tag Heuer to its late 1996 initial public offering, clearly sees Breitling as the nucleus of a group, a small group rather than a standalone property. Now in 2022, the American equity owners who had the, the majority stake in Breitling, CVC Capital Partners, they decided to cash most of the chips in a majority stake sale to a Swiss outfit called Partners Group. These equity groups all have really generic names, don't they? But the point here is that it's a sign of growth. 
They're taking a step forward. Real value was created for CVC to step out when they did. Because according to Morgan Stanley, Breitling increased sales 40% in 2021, so CVC must have seen a sell-high opportunity while it could still claim growth rates against 2020 pandemic baselines, which were always going to be favorable. But was it really a sell-high moment, or was it maybe a shadow of the future? The investment bank, we're talking Morgan again here, also declared that Breitling in 2022 entered the top 10 of Swiss watch brands by sales after languishing as far back as 19th as recently as 2017, the year of its initial sale, Breitling is now number nine at worst by Morgan's estimates. And I haven't seen their estimates for last year yet, but they may have even improved on that. Rob Corder, writing in Watch Pro, estimated in January 2023 that Breitling may already have become a $1 billion business, and that is a big deal. That would move them closer to the likes of Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet among the highest grossing brands under the big names like, for example, Cartier and Omega and Rolex. That's a real distinction. Also, the image has changed. I remember when I spoke to Georges Kern at the launch of the Navitimer 8 in uh, 2018, you know, he was putting a brave face on that. He told me a few months prior that a new collection called Aviator was coming, but that it was something that was given to him by the previous management, and he was going to do what he could with it, uh, but it was going to be less of a technical chronograph. And so eventually it looks like it was renamed Navitimer 8 to make it more closely tied to the company's most famous product line. But when it came out in February of 2018, I realized that was the watch he had planned to call Aviator. And they were putting, again, the most recognizable name on it and a happy face to make it seem like that was the watch they wanted to launch. But it wasn't really. He had a very different idea. He said in the future, first of all, Breitling's not just going to be about aviation. Second, the image has to change. Historic re-editions need to be true to history. The company needs to take control of its distributorship around the world. At the time, third parties still distributed Breitling in many major markets, and it was the largest brand that didn't control its own distribution. He was also saying that the watches need to fit human wrists, and frankly, the image of the company need to be more sophisticated and more mature. He showed us a never-to-be-repeated or released promo film that the previous management had created, and it was like women with cleavage and breasts and all this nonsense on the deck of an aircraft carrier while guys were like oogling them while jets flew by and giant watches were like cut every couple of seconds. It was embarrassing. It was the kind of thing that was not just like pre-Me Too era. It looked like something from one of those like 80s ski chalet movies that are so politically incorrect today they're uncomfortable to watch. Like, it, it was completely wrong for any brand today. And even as a guy, I thought it was cringeworthy. So Georges Kern has also revamped the image of the company and made it a lot more modern open and sophisticated, and I applaud that. This brings us to the present day. Before we explore some of the lingering weaknesses of Breitling today, and there still are some, let's talk about yours on mine. Viewerist shots number two. Kunal M sees the sights at New York City's Freedom Tower with Sartori Biard's SB04. I've got one of those coming myself. More info soon. Ron M and his Tudor Pelagos FXD U.S. Navy divers celebrate his graduation from Basic Underwater Demolition Seal, or BUDS. Congratulations on a monumental accomplishment. That is the toughest indoctrination system and program in the Navy. In terms of a session, that is the toughest route with the possible exception of sub-nuke, but a totally different thing. BUDS is about mental toughness. Okay, we have Kyle A. and his Panerai Luminor eight days celebrating a cruise with Disney in the British Virgin Islands. Sun V has the latest and greatest of everything here with his new titanium IWC Ingenieur and Porsche Taycan EV. A lot of fun on both counts. You've got the analog watch and I guess the quartz car. Travis K and his Tudor Black Bay 58 Blue explore Orlando, Florida together. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, let's see who's in the box now and what you guys are saying. We have... Wolfgang saying he heard Kern on a podcast saying they met a collector with 1,500 Universal Genève. 
That is officially the biggest watch collection numerically I've ever heard of. Previously, it was like 800. What else is going on? Celine Driver saying I have an Avenger Blackbird, gorgeous beast. Chris L is getting up early with us in Manila. Mason One, hello watch folk, hello Mason. And then we have Mr. Paradigm 1981, Universal Genève. Take the Breitling split second chrono, add some hand finishing in a gold case, winner and a great value. We have Fat Groove asking, what is the largest, what is Breitling's largest market? I believe it's still the United States. And then William Rizzo is joining in from the Florida Keys. Welcome, guys. Watch Enthusiast. I'm going to Geneva in April for Watches and Wonders. Any suggestion outside Watches and Wonders? Check out all the watch boutiques on Rue Rhone. Check out Rolex. Check out Patek. That's where they all are. It's like Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue in New York, only much smaller and easier to walk. If you can, go over to Rue de la Synagogue and check out F.P. Journe. At the very least, they'll let you into the lobby, and you can see some fun things there. Tim Mancuso joining in live. I always Always appreciate that. And Will Charlesworth saying, my first watch was a Breitling Aerospace gold and titanium. Stunning. Okay. Let's jump back into our regularly scheduled program. Breitling in 2024. Okay. Critical and constructive commentary. This is not destructive. This is not sour or pissy. This is an acknowledgement that things are going well. Here's how they could go even better. So having endorsed Breitling's overall direction and product philosophy in particular, it's important to emphasize that there's still plenty that could improve. So here are the oversights, missed opportunities, and failed executions that have kept Breitling short of its ultimate potential, at least for the last five, six, seven years. So there was the Navitimer 8 in 2018. Again, this was something inherited from the prior management. There's no way that they came up with this in a few months between the time that George Kern arrived in like July of 2017 and the time the watch came out in February of 2018. So again, took something called Aviator, called it Navitimer. They had a gala tour that went around the world with guest speakers and historical exhibitions, all sorts of celebrities. I saw Olivia Munn and Justin Verlander and members of the world champion Houston Astros and watch celebrities. Again, futility. It was the wrong watch at the wrong time. But that's okay, because better stuff came afterwards. I would say the big problem they've got right now, and this is a lingering weakness from the Schneider era, it's that too much unsold product seems to be floating in the space with discounts, gray market access remaining too high, and resale prices that really haven't improved all that much, at least on most of the models. Uh, example, here's the $9,500 Premier B01 Chronograph 42 on Breitling's site, and here are a bunch of gray market dealers ready to sell you a new old stock version at a discount already. In box, full papers. Here's another example. Fresh pistachio dial, so hot back in 2021, dealers were telling me it had become an allocated piece, Rolex style, that entailed a weight at dealers, aftermarket markups, and world-class value retention, and really, Dealers were being told how many of these they were getting. They couldn't just order them as needed. Well, just three full years later, retail is $8,750, but you can find dozens of them on Chrono24 with prices as low as the mid or even low 5,000s. So again, they've come down to earth. This doesn't happen with a really strong brand. Breitling's inability to sustain multi-year conditions of disciplined scarcity correspond perfectly to management and owner interests that focus on turnover rather than absolute margins and value retention, and by extension, brand equity, what the brand itself is worth. So if you're specifically trying to build something up to sell it, it's tough to say no to a sale at any price. Breitling's strategy here looks a bit like the 2014 to 2019 approach of the US oil and gas industry at the time, driven by new technologies that opened up new fields to extraction. Hundreds of companies in the space raced to boost volume and grab market share at all costs. And I emphasize that, at all costs. As a result, hundreds of them were already going bankrupt in 2019 before COVID hit. And of course, it continued when oil and gas prices crashed in 2020. So today, the survivors in that oil and gas space in the U.S. market, they play for profits, not volume. One must conclude that the last and longest mile for Breitling's current ownership will be converting their momentum into actual pricing power, both new and pre-owned. That is still to be seen. But it does look like under yet another equity group, 
And with the Universal Geneva acquisition, Kern is playing a longer game. He's not looking to dump in 24, 36 months. He's building this stuff up, so he's still got time to improve the pricing power there. So compared to pricing power and discipline, turnover and volume are just really easy. It's only once you start constraining volume, cutting off the gray market, buying up surplus inventory, buying back surplus inventory, and standing firm on price that you really know how strong your watch brand and watch business are. Okay, another big problem, too many model lines. Look at that, that's bewildering. Even I have trouble keeping track of that. And too many SKUs. Uh, stock keeping units. I don't care what you do Breitling, but find a way to condense this mess into four model lines at most. And they constrain and contain too many model variants. Trying to hold all of these different versions to be something to everyone, men, women, east, west, every budget, every wrist size, they contain too many variants. Core Super Ocean, Navitimer, Chronomats, sure, keep them. But do we really need filler like this? I think Breitling can get by and be a stronger brand if these things aren't in the catalog. And frankly, this is exactly the kind of watch that seems to find its way straight to the gray market. And, you know, this is just me going online, eBay, Chrono24, and checking aftermarket sites. They offer a lot of watches like this. So I don't have any special industry knowledge, but I've got two pairs of eyes and ten fingers. I can go online and search, and this is the kind of stuff that seems to be surplus to Breitling's core needs, and also damaging it on the aftermarket. Even ladies' models right here make no sense, because many women who like watches these days prefer to wear a men's mid-size model than something that's overly feminine and pandering like those. Okay. Now, another issue. I think this was a missed opportunity. Wasn't there a Navitimer 70th anniversary in 2022? You could have fooled me. Given a major anniversary for an iconic watch, the iconic watch for Breitling, surprisingly little was done to mark the occasion. That's the original small beaded bezel, monotone dial 806. That was a great watch. But again, very little was done to let people know that a major anniversary was here, and this is the time to get a Navitimer. Rolex last year marked seven, well, I guess at this point, 60 years of the Daytona in 2023 with an insane precious metal Le Mans theme factory-approved Paul Newman Revival. This wasn't like Tudor riffing on Rolex. This was Rolex riffing on Rolex, bringing back the Paul Newman for an incredible occasion. 100 years of Le Mans and the return of Ferrari, not just to the race, to the top step of the podium. It was a real occasion and a watch that will live in legend. Blanc Pain marked 70 years of the 50 Fathoms with imaginative bronze gold retro edition. That's the bronze gold right there. I think it's like 37.5% gold, but also palladium and silver with a cool straight lug, no crown guard, historically inspired design. And then this, which is modern and opulent and special and limited. Everything about the 70th anniversary 50 Fathoms was really special and memorable and scarce. And they were worth getting. People lined up to get them. There were wait lists. Folks had to be approved. That hadn't happened in a long time at a Blanc Pan dealer. Success. But Breitling gave us some colorful Navitimers that looked like something George Kern would have built in, I guess, his IWC days when he ran the German-Swiss brand for roughly 20 years. Uh, it seems like the way you keep like a stale model from flatlining in between redesigns, it didn't seem like the kind of thing you would do as the sole offering for the 70th anniversary of your icon. Okay, officially this was the 70th anniversary Navitimer collection, officially. And it was okay. I expected something more spectacular, like the scalding hot 2022 Beverly Hills limited edition. Can we go full screen with that? This was from 2022. This stupid thing, 50 pieces limited edition, black mother of pearl dial, tone on tone registers, cerulean blue accents. That should have been the 70th anniversary Breitling Navitimer. 50 pieces to really rev up the collectors and get them fighting for allocations. This 46 millimeter case should have been smaller, but black MOP, cerulean blue, the limited 50 piece edition that is truly scarce and exclusive, if they made 1,000 of them, they would all have been sold out. Even Vempe got into the act in 2022 with the Navitimer Signature, a limited edition of 200 pieces. Like the Beverly Hills, this seems cooler and more special than the actual 70th anniversary. Okay, 
Finally, another piece of constructed criticism. I still don't hear people talking of Breitling the way they did in the heady 1990s when many discussed it as part of the big three of Swiss luxury watchmaking alongside Rolex and Omega. Now to be fair, Rolex has accelerated away from both Breitling and Omega in recent years with its average transaction price now over 14,000 US dollars globally. But even compared to Omega, which has overproduction, weak model lines, and resale challenges of its own, Breitling seems to suffer by comparison, image-wise. And this is just word of mouth between collectors and retailers. I see Breitling's more often compared to Longines, Oris, Tudor, and Tag Heuer than Omega or Rolex, and Breitling needs to be mentioned alongside of Omega if the comeback is going to be complete. Given private ownership, even by an equity stakeholder, Breitling should have more restraint and a more focused vision than any brand in the publicly traded Swatch Group because we know they have no discipline whatsoever. Okay, wrist shot number three. Rory S and his Rolex Explorer explore the pool in Fuerteventura, Spain on vacation. Looking good. We have Jorge P and his 1916 purchased FP Jorn. Well, I guess it's not 1916 purchased yet because he tried it on at our event in Miami. We're also going to Newport Beach, California. So if like Jorge, you want to try on this Tourbillon Souverain Regent Circulaire, meet me on the 22nd and the 23rd at Hyde Park Jewelers in Newport Beach, California. You too can have your wrist on this show. Ethan S wins without a bike. But with his Tudor Heritage Advisor, he watches the stage winner at Paris-Nice. Lucas L. of Germany in his 90s Rolex Datejust welcome an extremely early bloom. And Marcos V. and Tomas the Dog appreciate his Rolex Explorer 2 Polar. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Stay with me, guys. Let's get up to 300 concurrent viewers. So Tyrio's P saying, I love the pistachio premier line chronograph. I do too. Marco D checking in from Sydney. Rob K from Toronto. And we have BNS saying, doesn't look like an explorer. And Wolfgang saying, hey, Jim. We got both Wolfgang and Jim tonight. Thanks, guys, for joining. We have Mr. Personality. Hi, Tim. Thanks so much for the show. A watchmaker from the Dallas area. Good to see you, man. Appreciate you keeping the faith. Okay, now let's talk about my favorite recent Breitling models. Here comes the hardware and the ones that I actually like. Color is king in my watch collection. You see it right here with my Dan Reuter, and it's going to be true with my Sartori Biard. And here's the 2024 Breitling Super Ocean 57 Highlands, a vintage diver after my own heart. At 38 millimeters, this should tickle the size purists who can reconcile themselves with the 800 watt mustard color dial. And that is what they're calling it, mustard. It's a mustard dial, mustard ceramic insert, and then a rose gold bezel on a steel case. At 9.3 millimeters thick, it is delightfully thin, one of the thinnest dive style watches I have ever seen. And the bezel, again, rose with a ceramic cap for richness and durability as well. It appears to have a chronometer certified Salida SW300, which is the thinner of the two Salidas. It's the equivalent of an ETA 2892. Automatic winding, 42 hour power reserve, hacking seconds, it is a certified chronometer, 100 meter water resistance, sufficient for general sportiness, if not outright diving. While a bracelet of mesh right here looks absolutely fantastic, the Scottish themed tweed Highland strap features silk and wool for a robust cottage spun look that just zings me. Look at how fine those lugs are. That watch is a winner, but it's a capsule collection, so one, maybe two years at most. Not limited by number, but limited by production scale. Care for some champagne? Another 2024 right here. Uh, 2020, late 2023 launch, I should say, um, but basically a watch that you're just starting to see now in 2024. 40 millimeters, steel, manual wind, no date. It is the successor to the much loved and coveted pistachio, and then the somewhat less known but no less attractive burgundy dial. Now it's a B01, if we go back to the champagne, that's become a B09, no date, twin registers, it's been decapitated or maybe its bottom has been sawn off because now it's a manual wind to make for a thin watch that's only about 13 millimeters thick. 100 meter water resistance is unexpected in a mid-century dress watch inspired timepiece. Nevertheless, it does add some legitimacy to its all-arounder status as it's swimmable, loomed, and steel. Very rugged, versatile. Uh, this is a 
want to be your only. The Champagne has a more metallic luster. If we go full screen here, take a look at some of those dial details. Well, the Pistachio and the Burgundy both have a metallic brushed sort of a sunburst. Here you can really see it, almost as though you're looking at the foam atop a heady flute of champagne. Very, very special and rich. Syringe hands here just zing me. Awesome details along with the 50 style tachymeter on the dial. $8,750 means this is priced right. Actually, I love the whole premiere line. There's the B25 Daytora, uh, a chronograph chronometer calendar watch that does a mean Patek Philippe 5270p impression for 14 grand. And of course, out a few years now, less if you buy the B25 Detour pre-owned. There's the B15 Duograph, a split seconds chrono for $10,950 that looks the part elegant, beastly, appealing. Oh hell, you can even get a white gold B21 chronograph tourbillon with a, well, a case and an anthracite dial to match. Super special and high end. It's got a big boy, La Jupere movement, providing column wheel, automatic winding, 55 hour power reserve, chronometer certificate. This thing is awesome and definitely lives up to the premium aspirations of the resurgent Breitling brand. This watch is still way too expensive at up to $71,000 with its blue dial, but it's cool and it's a mainstream brand. I always love to see a mainstream brand like an Omega or Breitling offering something like this, a complicated chronometer certified tourbillon, and it could be a fantastic pre-owned buy down the line. Now there are broadly in the Pilot's watch genre, Pilot's fashion accessories like this one, and then there are pilot's watches. And I guess the one that was supposed to pop up was the Rolex GMT, so I'm beating up on Rolex a little bit tonight. But this Breitling Aerospace Evo is a real pilot's watch. A bargain at $4,350 in titanium, 43 millimeters, tons of features, 100 meters water resistant, a dive bezel, lasts forever. I've seen Breitling Aerospaces come in still functional from the mid 1980s. It looks sharp as a daily driver, no reason this can't be your everyday watch. It wears small, all in titanium and 10.8 millimeters thick. Speaking of pilots, by the way, that would probably be my Breitling watch of choice, after which I would choose the Pistachio, but that would be number one for me. True luxury multifunction quartz, perpetual calendar, chronograph, dual time, analog digital, backlight, electronic minute repeater, three to four year power reserve, super quartz, loses or gains 10 seconds a year, thermocompensated, it has everything. But speaking of pilots, you don't need to be one to use Breitling's emergency, but you do need, well, an emergency to get away with it. Never a volume builder or a money maker for Breitling, the long-term presence of the emergency in the catalog since 1995 lends weight to Breitling's professional series and real life-saving potential for its user. Unlike anything else in the watch business, the Emergency 2 is a Breitling original and exclusive and a real distinction for the company's image, if not its bottom line. At 55 millimeters, it is huge, and this is strictly pure survival gear with the added bonus of a multifunction movement similar to the aerospace. It broadcasts at the old rescue frequency of 121.5 megahertz, but also the new one of 40, well, 406.0 for zero megahertz, and unlike the original emergency, this one can use the SARSAT network of satellites to extend its reach beyond the power of the transmitter itself. Once you hit the satellite, the satellite sends out the signal to all the other satellites. Make mine yellow. I will do offshore sailing at some point in my life. I'd like to sail around the world, and having this is serious peace of mind in case you fall overboard. Even with the tether, sometimes you just can't swim against the headway of your boat. That could be a lifesaver. As an American, I should mention, I've been told various times in my life that I should have ready and waiting everything from a personal arsenal, we love tremors, an all-terrain Humvee, just in case, and even a fully stocked personal bunker, you know, just because something might happen. What? Who knows? Something. But you need it, you'd rather have it, right? Hmm. The Breitling emergency might be an even better choice. 
Contrary to popular belief, it can be used for any legitimate non-aviation emergency if it's a true emergency. While fines for misuse range from $20,000 to over $140,000, shipwrecks, breakdowns in the tundra, and hiking disasters where life is at stake constitute legitimate use. On that last note, this guy would have been far better off that day had he packed this Swiss instrument instead of this Swiss instrument. Spoiler alert. Sure, it costs almost 16 grand, but the arm you save might be your own. Okay, as a guy who loves Swiss complications and American cars, I'm probably the target customer for the 2023 Top Time B21 Classic Cars Tourbillon Trio. Blue for the Shelby Cobra, sports a 44 millimeter ceramic case. A green dial is for the Ford Mustang with a 43 millimeter bronze case. And then the burl wood dial is for the Corvette and features, again, a 44 millimeter ceramic case. Movement's the same as the B21 Premier Chrono Torb, but the look is killer and make mine the wood dial. The burl wood would be my favorite anyway, but I'm a Corvette guy, so the fact that that is the Corvette watch means it's truly a perfect match. And frankly, at $47,000, this is a far better value than the Premier Tourbillon in precious metal. Finally, I dig the B02 Navitimer Cosmonaut. This is really cool. A tribute to the 1962 reference 809 informed by the recommendations of then American astronaut Scott Carpenter. This is a 24 hour time display with the Navitimer slide rule calculator and chronograph function. It's a 2022 limited edition of 362 pieces in steel, fairly true to history at 41 millimeters. It's not a strict reissue, but the most endearing features of the original watch are still present here. The case back reveals the rarely used B01 manual wind version, or B02 manual wind version of the B01 with the 24 hour hand. 70 hours, chronometer, column wheel, vertical clutch, COSC, and you can see the Aurora 7 mission logo mark 60 years since the original space flight when this came out in 2022. It looks like dynamite and even wins me over despite my Fotina skepticism. 11,500 on a full bracelet even seems reasonable, but I got to admit the strap look is the best look for this one. Okay. Viewer wrist shots number four. Danny N and company join with his wedding gift Panerai for an updated family photo with a new arrival. Professor Adrian forwards a high grade shot of the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra small seconds at close range. That is a great photo. Larry S. and his 1916 bought Omega Speedmaster, scale mount bachelor in Oregon. Stay warm and thank you for trusting our company. Danny K. from Lucerne and his girlfriend stopped for caffeine with the Ferlan Mari sector dial. And Brian M. takes us home in Amsterdam with his Reverso Duo Face tribute to 1931. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Thanks to Garrett, he had to bear with about 100 photos tonight. And thanks for you hanging in though we started late. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.